Are you ready, Tracy? For what? Lincoln. Lincoln was Lincoln Street. Okay, I've called the meeting back to order. Um, we previously were meeting in closed session. Uh, calling this uh, meeting to order. This is the annual meeting and budget hearing for uh, 2024 year um, in the overview. And I'd ask for all of those who are able to stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. And then we'll start with some introductions, and if we could uh, start with Brad, and you can just introduce yourself and go around uh, the room, and we'll tell each other who we are. Sure. Brad Baumgartner, Director of Student Services. Paula Johnson, Principal at Lean Elementary. Good evening, Jessica D'Ambrosio, Emory Intermediate School Principal and District Director of Curriculum and Instruction. Tom Benson, Emory Middle School Principal. Josh Gould, High School Principal. Joe Veer Kant, Board Member. Steve Osterow, Board Member. Charlotte Glenna, Board Member. Dale Johnson, Board Member. Gwen Dato, Board Member. Sean Derfler, District Administrator. John McBride, Director of Finance. Becky Schmidt, District Office Assistant. Thank you. And then we'll have the annual meeting parameters and election of a chairperson. Is there um, any nominations for a chairperson that does not necessarily have to be the board president? It can be anybody. <coughs> I would nominate Shar Glenna as the uh, annual meeting chair. Second. Are there any other nominations for a board member chair? Are there any other nominations for a board, for a um, chair? Any other nominations for a chair? Hearing none, we'll proceed to close nominations for the meeting chair and cast a unanimous ballot for Char Glenna as the meeting chair. All of those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, please signify by saying no. Hearing none, Shar Glenna is now appointed the chairperson. And with that, we'll start with the 2023-2024 district financial overview with a treasurer's report from Joe Beerkant. Good evening. As you are aware, the 2024-2025 district budget will change before it is finalized. Certification of our equalized valuation versus the estimate and the third Friday student enrollment count will affect our revenue limit and therefore change the budget proposed here. The 2024 through 2025 School District of Amory Fund 10 operating budget will be a total of $21,602,248 compared to the 2023 to 2024 unaudited expenditures of $21,456,957. This is a budget increase of 145,291, or a 0.67% increase. The levy, or the property tax, for Operation Fund 10 for 2023 through 2024 was $11,274,000, 864. The 2024 to 2025 property tax levy for operations will be approximately 12,623,719. This is an increase of 1,348,855. The increase in this levy is a direct result of a decrease in student, sorry, state aid coupled with an increased in equalized property values. It is an anticipated that state aid to the school district for 2024 through 2025 will decrease by 866,222 or 9.59% from the 2023 through 2024 fiscal year. This year, the estimated equalized valuation of all property located within the school district of Amory is 
$717,477,330. This represents an increase of approximately 5.85% from last year. Based on these estimates, the general mill rate will be $7.35 compared to $6.95 last year, an increase of 40 cents. Based on these projections, the school portion of taxes on a $100,000 property will increase by approximately $44. Thanks, Joe. Any discussion on that report? Fund 73 report, John? So Fund 73, um, other no, otherwise known as OPEB or the other post-employment benefits, uh, which covers our um, outside of our WRS retirement fund. Um, this is primarily to, well not primarily, it's solely to fund those with a uh, qualifying HRA upon their retirement. Uh, so the Fund 73 revenues for this past year, uh, again, this is all unaudited information, is for, was $411,200. Expenditures were the same. Um, it is odd to see both of those numbers the same, but it means that our account is very healthy and very happy. So we had the same amount of, uh, the basically the uh, actuarials were right for last year, is what that says. Once the audited figure comes back, I expect to see that waffle a percent or two just because of the way that they calculate amortization and things like that. Is there any questions as far as Fund 73? Okay. It's a riveting subject. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure you have all the answers though if we did have questions. I do not. <laughs> all right. Well, stay right there because I think you're on again for revenue and expenditures. Absolutely. So um, this is by no means supposed to be a in-depth deep dive into expenditures and revenues for last fiscal year um, that'll come in either november december or january when we do our audit report um, if you remember and that's something that we'll discuss at length later um, is when we want to do that but that's when i anticipate doing an actual full deep dive into our expenses and revenues for the board and for the public um, so just a general overview uh, again keep in mind this is unaudited information uh, last year, and we're going to speak specifically to 23-24, our unaudited revenues of $20,788,942.77. Our Fund 10 expenses were $21,456,957.38, which is a s deficit of $668,014.61. Now, during the course of our audit, that number has already been slashed into 10% of what it was. So do I expect there to be a deficit? I do. Do I expect it to be almost $700,000? Nowhere near that. Why is it in there? It's simply because Fund 38 and Fund 39 reconcile at the end of the year, which is what we're doing right now. So our first payments for our Fund 38 debt are taken out of general fund, which is the difference, okay. if that makes sense. Again, this is why I want to do a deeper dive into expenses and revenues with you guys after the audit. I'll be the first to tell you I don't like the timeline of when annual reports have to be done because it's unaudited information and unaudited information is only as good as what we know in, our, in front of us. Um, so as a percentage of expenditures, uh, that is or our fund balance 2.3816655 million. Uh, which is a balance of 11% over last year's expenditures, which is uh, right in the ballpark of what you want to see, somewhere between 10 and 15% is what you want to see. Um, so the rest of it, uh, we're welcome to go through. Um, essentially, uh, Fund 38, Fund 39, that's where all of our debt lives. Uh, our revenues last year were $11,065,383.35. Our expenses were $10,487,759.33. Our deficit was 500, or our surplus was $577,624.02. Why is there a surplus in that account? That's our interest earned to date. So that's what we've actually seen and what we've actually taken in. Our fund balance in there is $1,614,997.10. 
Our fall scheduled payments are $2,538,888.87. Which leaves our total balance post fall as forty-seven million eighty-five thousand twenty-four dollars and ninety-seven cents. Any questions with fund thirty-eight and thirty-nine? The math is kind of hard to follow because this one that the state wants to see us call out at our budget hearing and annual report calls for balance post fall payment. So essentially, it's our referendum debt plus our $5 million that we borrowed last year minus any payments that we've already made on that debt. But it doesn't take into account interest. Interest is outside of this. Fund 46, we didn't use a bit last year, so there was no ins and no outs. Again, Fund 46, for those who don't know, that's basically a uh, account for financial resources for the acquisition or construction of capital facilities. That's one that we funded many years ago. Uh, I think it's seven years ago now, Sean? Uh, you have to wait five years, and it's been two years since the yeah. five years. So I think so, we're at seven. For a frame of reference, that was what was used when we paved the road from the east to the west through the middle of campus. We used Fund 46 for that. So we still have $53,806.82 in there. Um, our Fund 50 revenues last year, Fund 50 being food service, was, were $1,259,187.50. Our expenditures were $1,415,149.68, which is a deficit of $155,962.18, which leaves the fund balance in Fund 50 as $355,421.52 to the good. Just to call attention to the Fund 50 lives outside of the general fund. It is operated as its own business. Why was there a deficit? The cost of goods, it's that simple. There was the cost of goods do not match what we are allowed by law to charge for lunches. So if you remember, Michelle asked for an increase for adult lunch prices this year. Um, student lunch prices aren't the problem, but then we also had decreased participation because of the cost of student of, of lunch. So we are taking better advantage of some programs, but we also had some equipment fail last year. So that account is still in the positive, which is a great thing to see because most of the state, their fund 50s have already returned to pre-pandemic levels at zero or needing a bailout from fund 10. Do we know, John, if that was that was the reason that we had less participation in food program is because of the increased cost in, or <laughs> because then we also have the free and reduced lunch yeah, program? Absolutely, or yeah. Is it just that we just have less kids overall? Well, so our, our, free and reduced po our free and reduced percentage was down last year for previous years, which is great for the community, but it's bad for food service, which is kind of a weird axiom to be in. Um, the other question is, do they just not like the food? That's a huge question. And the answer is, depends. Um, the reality is, on the record, we have to follow a very strict sodium guideline on the record. Right. <laughs> so the problem is that some of the kids are a little turned off, especially in the younger grades. At the high school, they just house everything. It doesn't matter. Right. But when you start talking about the elementary school and the intermediate school, the chicken nuggets that they eat at home look and taste nothing like the chicken nuggets they eat here. Sure. So they'll skip those days. And do, do you know, and maybe this isn't the question for you, but do you know if we've had people apply for free and reduced and have been denied? Uh, we've had a handful. Typically what we see is people that hover. And so if the, let's say it's one parent total household of four, the income could be, I don't know what it is, don't quote me on it, but it could be 42,000 and they'll get denied for 42,500 because they're being truthful on their applications. 90% sure. of our free and reduced applications come in through what's called direct certification. So they're already qualifying for some other subsidy and the state's basically telling us, hey, they fall into this group or this group. Um, it's the, the application ones are a little bit of a struggle because they ask for gross income, not net. And that can be really difficult when you're a single mother of four kids or three kids, whatever the case may be. Um, so I think Michelle did have to deny quite a few last year. Um, and if you have questions on how to properly fill those out, I would highly recommend calling Michelle prior to submitting them. Um, the good news is, is that the school district is able to do what is in the best interest of the kid when there's a question of eligibility within a certain margin. Um, so that's usually what we end up doing. Okay. 
Did that answer your question? Yep. Sorry, that was a lot for that, but I just wanted. No, to no, no. It's it's a great question. Okay. Um, so yeah, so fund seventy three we already went through, and then fund eighty that is community service and daycare. <laughs> Um, so the fund 80 revenues from last year were $1,132,856.85. Our fund 80 expenditures were $1,120,473.14. And our surplus or deficit was a surplus of $12,383.71, which brought that fund balance back up to a positive number for the first time in quite a few years. So fund 80 is where community education lives, but the biggest part of it for us is actually childcare. Childcare lives in fund 80 as well. So there was a budget surplus last year. Um, the reason for that surplus is simply we were collecting what was owed to the school district of Amory. So it was an interesting one when last year's outstanding debts meaning parents paid was about $30,000 at year end. This year is about 4,200. So we were really shaved off our delinquent accounts. So it was great to see. Okay. All right, and then the presentation of the proposed 2024-2025 budget. So the last page I just wanna call attention to is what Becky has up on the screen right here. Um, these are just kind of some visuals for what our, where our uh, revenues and where our expenditures, where our revenues came from and where our expenditures went last year. Um, so as you can see, the biggest piece of the pie is state and federal funds at $10,082,489, which equated to about 49.5% of our total budget came from those. Property taxes made up the second largest chunk at $8,475,000 and some change, and that was 41%. And then the other category, those are all the ancillary and subsidiary grants that we received throughout the year, came in at about 9%, or just over 9%. Our expenditures, the vast majority of our expenditures go straight to salaries and fringe benefits. Um, all in all, it makes up approximately uh, almost 90% of our budget. Yeah, well, that's a lie, almost 80% of our budget. So it's a big chunk. Um, and that's because of the commitment you guys have made to our staff and to protecting the benefits that are owed here. Um, the rest of it is just kind of a smattering of general supplies, purchase services, uh, insurance costs, capital purchases, and capital leases. And the capital purchases last year, the reason that one's higher than you typically see is because of Jorgensen Field. Any questions as far as that's concerned? Sorry, John, I stomped on the pie graph there. It'd be nice to no, 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 there. no, no worries whatsoever. <laughs> it just trampled right on all over that. Yeah, <laughs> yep, yep. All right, so the proposed 24-25 budget. Um, so there is a typo on the first page, and I will send out a revision as well. Um, actually, there's a, two typos on the second page that led to a typo on the first page or an error in the formula. If you look at that first category that says $1.858 million budget uh, or total fund balance, uh, that's wrong. That would be a decrease in $600,000 year over year and I am not budgeting for a $600,000 budget deficit. Where that comes up, Becky, if you wouldn't mind going to the second page, in our revenues, uh, the DPI special project grants, um, there's just a, I just must have fat fingered the keyboard, that's supposed to be $475,000. And then on the bottom, the other feather, federal revenue through state, that should be $300,000. So what that brings us to is a total fund balance at the end of the year of $2,258,631.58. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So. Not to harp on that, so essentially, um, again, I, I will answer any questions that you have. I will gladly go into as much or as little detail as you want. Uh, the basics are pretty <coughs> straightforward. Um, we are, tax levy for this year is increasing, um, and I will just take that right on, the, right on its head. The reason why that is increasing is simply because of two factors. Number one is a decrease in state aid due to declining enrollment and declining uh, uh, state aid to school districts. And the second one is another large increase in your equalized property value for the school district of Amory. So there was across the board, there was an increase of, I think on average it was 5.6%. I don't think it's in this booklet, but it was 5.6% increase 
in your total equalized property value. So it went from one and one point six and a half up to one point seven billion dollars. Because of that, as the more wealthy that the community becomes, relatively speaking, the less state aid and the more burden on the taxpayer there is. So does anybody have any questions as far as that's concerned? I do have a great visual if you would like to see it. Um, this is what we've gone through years in the past. This is actually through the Baird model, which is what we use for our budget forecasting uh, and budget. So what it equates to is a 40 cent increase in our overall tax or our mill rate, which for just simple math purposes is $40 worth of increased taxes for every $100,000 worth of property value. So if your home is worth 100 grand, it's gonna be $40 more this year. If it's 200 grand, 80, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this one right here, and this will also be available on board book after the fact for anyone in the public who wants to see it. This just does a really good job of breaking down how all of this comes to fruition and how we get the numbers that we get at. But I do want to say one thing, which is you guys approve the levy, but the levy is set through the state. So there is a calculation that is done using enrollment, using our third Friday pupil counts, our amalgamation of our per pupil adjustments, all of our recurring exemptions, non-recurring exemptions, such as our declining enrollment exemption that we're getting every year because we are a school that's in declining enrollment. That all comes into our total levy, uh, our revenue limit authority. The revenue limit authority minus all of our equalization aids is how we arrive with our allowable revenue limit for the tax levy. Then we take those, we take that number, and then we add, add anything that's referendum approved debt. We add any community service tax levy. We add any prior year chargebacks, which there weren't any from this year. Uh, and that gives us ultimately what our total tax levy is for the year. Any questions as far as that's concerned? I always love this graphic. It's, awesome. it, it's a great graphic. Yeah, it's a great graphic. And uh, the, the reality is, is that as the community starts to grow, TIFs, TIDs, all that stuff, so tax incremental districts, the city of Amory <laughs> imposed another one this year, which is just south of the school district here. So that tax burden gets spread out onto the tax base. It doesn't just go away. Somebody else is covering that. So as TIFs come in, or as TIDs come in and TIFs come off, that number can change, and we did have one large TIF that fell off, but we had another TID that came in right on its shoulders. So unfortunately, it's just where we're at. So, so Jonathan, uh, yes. I guess after that entire spiel, which was a lot to, <laughs> Process. Reflect, to reflect on, Yeah. Um, I guess my challenge is for the council, for two years now, I brought up declining enrollment and asked us, what are we going to do about it then? And it, it, again, I'm, Jonathan, my biggest thing is, is I, I don't care if it's public education or if it's my personal finances, I'm trying, I'm trying, uh, I'm trying to save money. And we did already assist in upping the taxes in the community. So I know it's not just you, Jonathan, but it's us. I think we really need to look at what are we going to do? Are we going to get serious about declining enrollment and how it's going to affect the operation of the school district? Um, you know, and again, in the future, are we going to continue to take out these short-term loans to, to, to pay the bills here? So again, I, I get we're, we're talking about the numbers right now, but I want to look at underlying issues because I don't want to keep going to the taxpayer who's already been burdened with more taxes and continue to say it's going up, it's going up, it's going up. You know, for many of us who thought we had a you know two hundred thousand dollar home and now it's a half a million after this reappraisal stuff, um, this is going to affect our funding. And so I and, and again I I want us to start looking for solutions. I think there's 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 a lot of solutions that keep getting proposed at the state level um, because Wisconsin is one of the few states in the nation that still fund on a per pupil calculation, and you know keep in mind the the per pupil categorical aid 
went up last year for the first time in many years. And before that, it was many years. And before that, it was a big reduction under Scott Walker. And so the, the per pupil aid they keep playing with, and as long as it's tied to the FTE count, and the FTE count, which is an over cumbersome process, if you ask me, um, is is it somewhat inherently flawed, then there's going to be these kind of waning numbers. What the state really needs to do is increase that per pupil funding and so that we can reduce what the tax impact is. Um, you know, again, the hard part is that the calculation is, like you said, a $200,000 house became a half a million dollar house. And if you asked every one of the 421 school districts in the state of Wisconsin, their taxpayer to state funding it, percentage is completely different. I was talking to Sean earlier. Mequon Thienesville on the east side of the state is almost 95% public or property tax funded and 5% from the state because it's just so wealthy. And so it's, it's hard because you want your property values to go up. Who doesn't? But at the same point, the more money you get or the, the more rich your community is, the more they want from you. So I think it's a great conversation to have here. What are we doing about declining enrollment? How are we making sure that the budget is balancing or going down on an expenditure side of things? Um, but I think it's also a bigger conversation to how do we need to start having these conversations more with the state, if that makes sense, because the revenue limit authority, all that sort of thing, some say it's an antiquated procedure. Some don't like the way that it's done. Um, but at the end of the day, it's just kind of, it, it's not what people I think have in their minds for how this stuff is set. Does that make sense? So a as far as what are we doing on our side, you know, the big one is just cutting expenses. That's the biggest controllable factor that we have here is cutting expenses wherever we can cut expenses. For instance, in this budget, if you look through when we start getting towards um, capitalization and we start talking about more of those building services, construction services, the, it is at least my opinion that after this referendum, at least two of our buildings should be at 95% good to go. So we can reduce that budget line just by a little bit, just so that because we shouldn't need to have to worry about boilers and everything. Does that make sense? So that's kind of the principle that I went into this budget cycle with. Um, and every year is another opportunity to spill your Diet Coke, but every year is an opportunity to look at those budgets again and say what we want. Um, yeah, I guess that would be my, my spiel, if that and makes sense. And I guess when you're talking about <coughs> controlling costs, and that's the biggest factor that we can control, but I'm looking at, I've been doing this now for seven years, and certainly not as senior member of the board as Dale is, who's been doing this for 32 or five years, yeah. but <laughs> um, when we're talking like our 23, 24 expenditures that 80% of that budget was made up by employee benefits and, and salaries, but we make a commitment that this, all, every member on this board has made a commitment to retain employees and to attract employees. 80% is kind of shocking to me especially since I think when it, six years ago I started, we were in the neighborhood of around 60%. This is 20% uh, of well, our budget increase. I, I, I would say it's usually been <clears throat> 70 plus probably for salary and benefits, but. I think most of our cohort yeah. districts are somewhere between 70 and 80%. Yeah. I think that's on average, it just depends on the size of the school district, their funding sources, all that sort of stuff. Um, you know, the, the, the hard part is the inability to raise money. That's the problem I think we all struggle with, especially if you're used to the personal side of things. If you have more expenses than you do revenue at home, well, you gotta learn how to cut expenses or make more money. And the problem is, is we just simply can't with the exception of going after grants. Well, grants only get us so far. Um, one of the things that we should be very thankful of that a lot of our school districts don't is we wisely spent S or three funds. A lot of school districts use that to balance their budget for all three cycles of S or funds and S or and, and ancillary funds. And we did to a certain extent, but we didn't go out and hire 15 people 
on that, right? We hired two. And so the reality is, is there's a lot of school districts out there that are hurting a lot worse because that budget line item for DPI special project grants didn't go down by 600,000, it went down by 5 million because they just use their ESSER funds in, in maybe not the most advisable way. Um, and so those, but those grants are few and far between. Did that answer your question, Joe? Yeah, it, 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 feel free to ask any questions that you want. I, I don't have the answer for declining enrollment and how to increase that. I wish I did, um, but it is a statewide problem. We're not the only school district, even in this county, that is experiencing that. In fact, Grantsburg's probably the only one that's not, still, would be my guess. So, anyways, so the budget, basically, um, the, the big scary figures are on page two, total revenues uh, is the first one. And you can see that there is, I am uh, budgeting for an increase in uh, total funds to the school district of Amory, um, but that comes in the form of special education and other federal funding sources that will be an increase this year. Not a large increase, but a, a very modest increase. Um, so revenues, again, just pretty straightforward. You can just kind of look through there. That number is 100% not final by any stretch of the imagination. There's all sorts of adjustments, refund of disbursement, medical services disbursement, miscellaneous. There's a million different revenue lines that come in here. So using round numbers based off of prior year uh, is the best outcome. Um, for instance, we started accepting electronic tickets for sporting events and saw an increase in how much revenue we were taking in per game when it came to that for the, I think, six games, I think, that we used huddle tickets for, which was great. So the next few pages, or the next, I guess, uh, half a page is just the overview of, of um, uh, expenses. Um, if we are talking about um, specific to uh, income and everything, this does include uh, the pay increases that you guys authorized last year in here, uh, but I did base this off of actuals from last year. So one of the things typically you see when the budget cycle is if you guys approved a categorical 3.5% budget, people just put 3.5% in the increase column and just let it ride, um, but that's based off of the previous year's budget, not actual. So we did have decreases in some of our categories last year just simply because we were short staffed and I don't see and all the experts are saying that that problem is likely going to continue for the foreseeable future. So I went with actuals and what the actual cost was times the increase that you guys witnessed. As far as benefits are concerned, uh, it's kind of along the same lines. So we did have an increase in essentially every single one of our insurance costs last year, as you remember, health insurance, dental stayed flat, vision stayed flat, limited or long-term disability, short-term disability, they all stayed nice and flat with the exception of health insurance, and we did have an increase, um, and this does account for that increase as well across the board. Um, so the total expenditures on the bottom of that page, 22125000 282000 or $282.37 um, is still, like I said, projected to be more than revenues, but the best wisdom is to over budget on expenses and underestimate on your revenues so that you can be a little bit more realistic with how you're cutting. Does that make sense? And if you hate my logic, that's fine. I will definitely change it. No, I always think that in a budgeting logic, that's always the most appropriate way to go. Um, I guess um, I, I kind of wanted to talk about that. Joe's, you know, asking how how are we going to handle this declining enrollment and getting serious about cutting the budget? Um, and it kind of looks like you've estimated places that we need to to pull back. Is that something that you think that the board needs to? Um, have a special meeting regarding where the board members need to meet with you and have areas that the board members have suggestions of where do we cut those expenses? Or? Yeah, absolutely. Whether it's through a special meeting, whether it's through 
um, just looking through. Um, this is just one version. I'll, I'll say it's the easiest and most palatable version for people who are not daily in the business office to read because it's the amalgamation of everything. And so if you look at the full Baird model, which is what we use to do our budget and our forecast, you get lost really fast. I mean, I, it just, it's very easy because it's broken up by location and object and all sorts of stuff. This is a by function report here. Um, so you can see some of the areas that, that I did. So if you were to go to, um, for instance, let's see, let me just pick a good one, sorry. Well, I guess I don't really have a good example here. <laughs> pardon, pardon me. Um, but the, because this is based off of function, not object. But yeah, we absolutely could. I would welcome that. I absolutely would. And, and I would say that that would be something that I would also like to see, you know, if it was in your guys' best purview. I would like to see something like that happen every March or April when we're kind of in the heat of budget season so that we can start kind of talking about things a little bit more in real time, if that makes sense. Yeah. Well, two things. We have a strategic plan that starts next week, Wednesday, and enrollment is a piece of that. That's one of the legs, if you will. Um, so that's a conversation that could begin right there. And second, uh, declining enrollment is directly linked to staff reduction, and we have been reducing staff. And we already have a plan for reduction of staff. We already have a spreadsheet. The administrative team and I have looked at it a thousand times in regards to enrollment as it relates to the elementary, intermediate, middle, and high school. So there will be a dip in enrollment that was at the elementary. That's already happened, over with and done with. The next dip is at the intermediate school. And that dip will hit the intermediate school next year. And there'll be likely two staff reductions at the elementary. And I can't imagine that that's a secret to anybody based on the enrollment that was at the elementary. So that's where you also save money. You don't have to cut programs and things. Sometimes you don't have enough instruct, or you have too much instructor for the number of kids. And that's where the cut comes from. So you said you have a, we have a report on attrition, we'll say? Okay. Yeah, that we, we were given that. Do we have a, I mean, because that's my, that was one of my on concerns. On staff attrition? Several years ago, again, if our, our enrollment's declining and we continue to keep the same amount of staff, we're just continuing to pay more than well, we, we have to. And again, I thought we were going to try to take care of that rather than going, if you resign, then you, we could not fill that position through attrition. Well, we haven't done that because right here in this room, we have met and I've, sh I've showed the entire board and the administrative team those numbers and the reduction in that graph that, that still exists. And you could see it again as strategic plan. We can look at that right then and there. Yeah, I think we were given that handout. It, it, we've already done that. I don't remember, I remember it. Yep. Can you give it, I'm, again, sorry, I don't remember it. Could you just send it to me or? We'll talk we about it this. next, we'll have it next Wednesday at our, at, our, at that ready. Uh, but we, we have matched declining enrollment with reduction in staff. That has happened. Elementary school is proof positive that that has occurred. Mm -hmm. There's also other factors, I-8s on the staff list retiring, getting replaced by A3s and B1s and all that sort of stuff as well that is a little bit harder to forecast, mm -hmm. um, but is ultimately taken into the equation as well. Mm -hmm. And we did talk about that when we talked in, in March, yeah. <coughs> February, March, when we did that. Yep. Um, but then I think it's important that yes, we do have um, some declining enrollment in the elementary that we are not filling those positions, but we did have those conversations when we talked about the strategic plan uh, a couple of weeks ago. But it's, pa it's past tense. The elementary declining enrollment has already happened. Yes. And, and it's, we're, as, we're there. Yes. The, it's, it's already reduced. Next year is set at the elementary to look very similar to this year. Where it looks different is at the intermediate school where you had approximately 295 students. Now you'll have 265 students. That equals two staff. That's where you get the number two. Because over the course of the last 10 years, you've dropped about 100 students at the intermediate school, if you look at the numbers, approximately. Next year, you'll drop about 30, which again, classroom size here is 16, 17. That's about two people. And that's already a conversation that Jessica and Paula and I have had. We've been talking about it for three years. And I, but I, I think there's the, that converse there that even though that we're, you know, could be looking at not having as many staff at the elementary and intermediate levels, we've talked about even in our strategic plan meeting 
adding teachers at the high school level and middle school level, like to our ag program, looking at tech ed program, we've, we've had those conversations that we would like to do. So um, as we keep that in mind, attrition in some buildings looks very different that we're replacing and even maybe adding staff in other buildings. So does that seem like if we were to have a meeting in the spring, like does that seem to like kind of help try to take care of that challenge admission to the to the board to try to cut these costs? And well, we the, come with the trick on timelines is this, your retirement date uh, is set at March 1st, so then you know exactly who your I-8s that are retiring, because typically retirees are in the I's, they've been here 25 plus. So you know those folks, and you know in most cases you're gonna retire out in the I's, making a lot more than you come out of UW River Falls as an A-1. You're, you're, you're paying that person less. So you'll know your retirements at that point. Most of your staff movement, you'll know if someone's leaving for unforeseen reasons, you'll know that. You'll know your enrollments better. So if you're having conversations with budget as it relates to enrollment and staffing needs, it needs to happen in March. But then you also have to be weary on the other end because now you're talking about issuing issuance of contracts has to be done by a set date by state statute. <laughs> so people can get them signed and turned back in. And that date is mid-May, mid and then enrolling people in insurance. So the sweet spot on that is March. Yeah, I would think. At the latest, April. Yeah, I would think that that would be a timely mm -hmm. manner to do that. Does that sound like a, like a good solution of kind of that challenge that you're talking about of like, where do we go? I mean, if, it's, if that challenge is to us, then I think that we need to have that conversation. Well, I was thinking that challenge would be to you because after April, I don't really care. Well, I, you're here now, and you brought it up so, now, and you need to care now, and that's where you're still. That this job I'm not still carries be able you to partake May. in that meeting. So you know, but you're the one that's going to be here to set that budget for the next year. Your work isn't done just because you are not running. Yeah, it. I like the idea. Let's come up with some strategic budget. You know, just going after it. Let's try to figure mm -hmm. this solution out. Okay. Thank you. And I think All to right. your. Uh, can, I know to your thing of I what I hear you saying is that it's if we have if we know they're coming and we have um, staff retiring or leaving it's better than fight, you know, having to cut someone no one wants to do that and that's how in, in actuality with the the I can't remember if there was two or three at the elementary that positions were three total there was three reductions last year in elementary not last year over the course of the last over two the years. last two years and then um, but the, all of them were through attrition I mean yes they were class size natural. Reduced, <coughs> natural, yeah, natural attrition. attrition somebody left out retirement somebody went to a different spot did a different yeah. thing and that's typically the easiest spot we've got I don't know I'm not gonna play the retirement lottery but I'm sure we've got some folks that are thinking about it and uh, those are the easiest people you don't have to worry about them you're not hurting anyone's billings they're leaving we're just not replacing them. Mm -hmm. okay I have a note to schedule that meeting in probably March and we'll take care of that <coughs> So the, the next few categories, we're just gonna kind of go over pretty fast. Fund 21, which is student activity accounts. Uh, those are accounts that are not controlled by the board. Therefore, they're not controlled by us. Those are the booster clubs, the angel funds, the family fund nights. That's all of those organizations are housed in uh, Fund 21. So the budgets that's set there is really just kind of a placeholder and best practice that's been passed on to me. Um, but the reality is, we were talking about it before you guys all came in here, the community takes care of the angel funds here and those are the biggest ones that are in there. So um, that's what's really nice to see and all those are still alive and healthy and the Fund 21 gets to carry over year versus year, which is great. None of them were negative last year and that's what you really look for. Um, next up is special education. Now special education is a little bit interesting as well in the state of Wisconsin because you're primarily funded two ways. The first one is, well, three. The first one is uh, flow through aid through the federal government for special education. And the basic principles there is last year's expenses equals this year's revenues as far as that's concerned. So the more people, students you have that have IEPs and 504s and are part of student services, uh, the more funding that they get the next year for the most part. Um, the second one is through categorical aid, which is a subsidy from the state. Uh, and then the third and arguably the biggest is through a Fund 10 transfer. Uh, and the Fund 10 transfer comes straight out of G Fund 10 right into Fund 27. Um, so I am projecting a slight decrease in overall revenues uh, and a uh, with a 
what if you go to the back and you look at total other revenue uh, other revenues and financing it is a decrease overall in those revenues and it is a decrease in the total expenditures uh, the reason why that it is showing a deficit there uh, is simply in the personal services world sorry kind of a tongue twister to say there so we also have debt service fund which is fund 38 fund 39 again these ones are not a whole lot to talk about there um, you've got the referendum approved debt at fund 39 and you got the non-referendum approved debt which is fund 38 um, so basically year over year what you're going to see over there is this is how much money you took in via interest and other avenues uh, and this is what our payments were going out, uh, which should match what um, which should match what uh, is posted online, and it was in the amortization schedules that were provided to you guys. Uh, project capital projects fund forty nine. That one goes down, and if you look very closely, you'll see a lot of zeros. That's because all of the projects that have been being worked on for the better part of the last two years are supposed to end January 1st. And when that happens, Fund 49 should be zero um, because that's just kind of an in and out. That's how we account for the draws and everything from Carl Sanderson, LHB, you name it. Uh, second to last, we've got food service. Again, food service. I am uh, projecting a slight increase this year um, because the state numbers for free and reduced came back that it looks like statewide there's going to be an adjustment from the federal government that's in the favor of our families. So hopefully we will see a lot more people qualify um, and get booted away, which should put our uh, participation rate back at what it was uh, and so we should see an increase in revenues um, and we should see a slight decrease in expenses um, just because those food prices are starting to stabilize a little bit more. Except for dairy. But it ain't going to you. It's not going to me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> last and lot last and certainly not least um, community service fund again this one is pretty this is a pretty simple one to budget relatively speaking um, Tracy does great things so hers budget usually stays pretty flat um, but she also takes in more revenue than she spends so that's good um, and as far as child care is concerned we know what our ratios are so we know what our max amount of kids are and right now last I checked we had 60 some kids on the waiting list yes. so regardless if we lost 10 percent of the population in that building it'd be churned and burned by the end of the week and so th that should stay flat as well any questions? Declining enrollment, but never any shortage of kids don't need daycare, I guess. <laughs> and I think the booms are coming. Yeah. I think we're two years out from starting to see the COVID boom. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> or there was a COVID boom. <laughs> Come on. All right. Great job. Any more questions on that? John, did you have anything else there? I, I don't. I mean, obviously, I'm, I'm, this is only my second budget cycle. Um, this is the first one with me more or less at the helm. I am absolutely open for discussion, questions, comments, concerns, different ideas, different approaches. Um, for me, I just have been going off of what those who have talked to me have advised and helped with and then looked at that. So I just, I welcome that as a good conversation. And then if special meetings is how we do it or whatever, I would love the opportunity to have more of a collective approach to budgeting. Okay, sounds good. Okay. And then the hearing on the proposed budget, I think we're just supposed to community feedback at this point. Absolutely. Is there any, any community feedback? <laughs> In, in my vast majority of people that came to watch. <laughs> no. Okay, well, hearing none then, we will move on to the uh, resolutions. And I think I get to read all these fun, fun statements. So, um, the state law require that the following resolutions be acted upon each year at the annual school district meeting, giving the Board of Education the necessary legal authority to operate to the schools. Resolution A is the approval of proposed 2024-2025 tax levy. Resolution, be it resolved that there shall be levied upon the taxable property of the school district of Amory the tentative sum 
of $12,623,719 for, per for the purpose of defraying the operation and maintenance of the public schools for the 23-24 school year. The projected mill rate shall be 7.35. Is there a motion to approve the proposed 2024-2025 tax levy? Anybody can move this. So Not only a board member. If you live in the school, district, in the school of district of Avery. So moved. Tom, is there a second to approve the proposed budget? I'll second it. Steve. Is there any discussion on approval of the proposed 2024-2025 tax levy approval? Hearing none, let's proceed to vote. All of those in favor of approving the proposed 2024-2025 tax levy, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, please signify by saying no. Motion carries, we approve the proposal of the 2024-2025 tax levy. Resolution B, school board salaries. Be it resolved by the electors of the school district of Amory that the yearly salary for the members of the Amory Board of Education be $3,000 and the district is authorized to reimburse members of the Amory Board of Education for actual and necessary expenses when traveling in the performance of duties. Is there a motion? I'll make a motion for the letter B salary. Josh, is there a second? I'll second that. Aaron, thank you. Is there any discussion on school board salaries? Hearing none, we'll proceed to vote. All of those in favor of the school board of education, $3,000 and expenses, uh, reimbursement of expenses of traveling and performance of duties, please signify by saying aye. 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 All of those opposed, please signify by saying no. Motion passed, resolution is to adopt the, to continue with the $3,000 salary for the school board members. Resolution C is for accident insurance for students. Be it resolved that the Board of Education of the School District of Amory may provide for accident insurance covering students in the district and that the cost and expenditures for said insurance is hereby authorized. This falls under section 40.30, subsection 19 of Wisconsin statutes. Is there a motion to approve accident insurance for students? I'll make a motion. Joe, is there a second? Second. second. Gwen, is there any discussion on accident insurance for students? Hearing none, we'll proceed to vote. All those in favor of approving this accident insurance for students, please signify by saying aye. 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 All of those opposed, please signify by saying no. Resolution passed. Accident insurance for students will be provided by the school district of Amory. Resolution D, 2025-2026 annual meeting date. Resolution, be it resolved that the Board of Education of the School District of Amory be authorized to hold the 2025-2026 annual school district meeting on Monday, September 15, 2025. Also section 120.08, subsection one, Wisconsin statutes. Is there a motion to approve? I'll make that motion. Steve, is there a second? Second. I'm sorry, is that Tom? Yep. Thank you. <coughs> All of those in favor of approving the 2025-2026 annual meeting date of Monday, September 15th, 2025, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, please signify by saying no. Resolution passed. The meeting date will be Monday, September 15th, 2025. Okay, and that's all for that business. And is there any other business to legally be considered at the annual meeting at this time by any taxpaying citizen that's in attendance. Seeing none, I will entertain a motion to adjourn the annual uh, budget meeting. I'll make that motion. Steve, is there a second? Second, to Josh. Josh. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All of those in favor of, signify, of um, adjourning the meeting for budget hearing, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, please signify by saying no. Meeting adjourned. Okay. We'll now move into the regular meeting of the Amory Board of Education for uh, this month. And 
Um, I think it would be, uh, we'll start with the consent agenda items. I had Steve, the, you yeah, had those? I had the consent agenda items. Everything looked to be in order, and I would make a motion that we accept what was presented <coughs> to me. Is there a second? Second. It's been properly moved and seconded to approve the consent agenda items. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, we'll proceed to vote. All of those in favor of approving the consent agenda items for this evening, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, please signify by saying no. Motion passed. Administrative Committee Department reports. Administrator reports. You're up. All right. Um, at the high school, we've been off to a great start to the school year. I really want to give a lot of credit to our senior class who's really stepped up and led by example, by leadership. They've just done a really great job. But that would not have been possible without all the people that we had coming in the last like Labor Day weekend. Just a boatload of hours, you know. I can't thank Becky Schmidt, Tracy Hendrickson enough, all of our custodians. I mean, staff members brought family members in. Like, I can't even explain to you the, the work and effort that went into it up and through Labor Day Monday. It was a ginormous thing, and uh, our custodians, I just can't say enough about their hard work and everything they put into it. So thank you to everybody who made our kids' first days of school so great, and our kids, they came in with big smiles, and they still are. They find a high school kid, and they'll tell you how much they love the building right now. So um, We are in the finishing stages of a lot of the high school remodel projects. We still have a couple of our favorite workers that are still with us and will be with us for a couple more weeks yet, kind of closing up shop on some things. Uh, we had the annual fall festival activities, uh, band, queens, parade participants, all of it was wonderful. And then just because it's fall in Emory, we want to do homecoming next week and get that on right away as well. So homecoming kicks off next week. Uh, no school for students on Monday, but we have a week worth of activities Tuesday through Friday next week. That's why you do that, isn't it? You purposely move <laughs> homecoming week to the four-day week. Uh, I, I always want it later, but... We, <laughs> Staff I likes the warm weather. In the past, for do it the same week. I'm like, that's a bit much. I don't think we're doing that. <laughs> uh, at the middle school, we're busy too, and I want to commend all the staff in my building and all the teachers that gave the kids a, a great start. We didn't have any anywhere near the the barriers that the high school and the elementary did, uh, and I commend all those teachers as well. But um, again, we had staff doing great things for kids. Uh, we're off with a lot of middle school sports and activities. I uh, was really happy to see our cadet band do such a nice job marching with Meredith Engian, or Meredith Rhodes Lundgren, sorry. And uh, our sporting teams are off to a good start right now. We have kids in football, volleyball, and cross country. Uh, so we have a student leadership training coming up, and so teams are going to go through a training on September 30th. The students that are interested in being involved in some of those activities, can, they, uh, they apply in, and, uh, and then we work with those students on... Um, how to help lead the school with activities and, and plans. Uh, we're off to WAPO um, and our annual WAPO event with eighth grade. It's a team building, um, anti-bullying field trip out at WAPO and then we come back for a little bit more of an anti-bullying um, audit in the auditorium, um, a session with kids on October 18th. Uh, Josh had mentioned uh, teacher in service coming up on Monday and we're gonna be really, really busy working on uh, building goals and then um, classroom management techniques, and we have an outside speaker coming in, so I'm excited for that. Uh, we also have, will participate in the homecoming, and I believe there's gonna be a homecoming parade, and our students are, are, are planning a float for that. And then we're gonna have a Warrior Way celebration and talk about what it is to uh, be responsible, safe, and respectful. Uh, Parent-teacher conferences are coming up soon, and parents can expect uh, in a couple of weeks to get uh, a link to sign up for any of the buildings and p teachers can parents can come in and meet in person or they can option have the option of, of doing it digitally over the phone in, in, a, in a different way uh, that has been something that's been really different over the last couple of years but I think parents really like the option of being able to do it in two different ways uh, our last day of first term uh, coming up is October 16th and that's the end of the first six weeks where our students then their applied arts courses will switch and then we have some fun dance activities, lots of stuff going on. Great. Any questions? Uh, any way you can get parent participation, I think is great. So options yeah. are always fantastic. Yep. 
All right, intermediate. Um, inter uh, our open house went very well. Actually, some classroom teachers reported 100% attendance, which was fantastic. Um, it's always really well attended. We do a fun bingo style activity where each grade level has a different bingo card. They get to tour the school. Third grade obviously looks a little bit different than fifth grade. We want them to get familiar with our building. Um, but it was very well attended, and also our IPO provides popcorn as the final prize of the bingo card. So thank you to our IPO for consistently supporting us. First days of school are going very well, as Tom just shared. Um, intermediate school navigated it a little bit differently, obviously, than elementary and high school. We've spent a lot of time with our students over the last two weeks getting them to relearn the Warrior Way, just reminding them of different spaces in our halls and, and what our expectations are. FastBridge is our district assessment tool that we use three times a year, so intermediate school is going this week. Um, so we'll use that data within the next couple weeks. We'll evaluate it actually doing in-service and we start to build our RTI groups, which is response to intervention. So we'll look at what skills um, does each individual student need to work on and then we'll build groups around that to do either reteaches or um, accelerate some learning for other students. New staff essential classes, so myself and Mr. Gould taught the first class in our series. So we have a mentor-mentee men, mentor -mentee program, and within that we have new teacher classes that touch on a variety of subjects. So there's one um, usually each month all the way up until about January, February, and we just really try to highlight things that are um, pertain to educator effectiveness or that really pertain in specific to our district or our buildings as well. Our fifth grade leadership students, they have already started supporting our school here. They actually ran the stations of our reteaches over the last couple weeks, teaching students um, expectations within the school and then even on the playground. So thank you to Mr. M, Mrs. Pearson, and our fifth grade leadership students. Safety drills. Today and tomorrow, our intermediate school students are walking through safety drills. Our teachers lead them with developmentally appropriate language. If we were in a crisis, what does that look like in specific to their classroom environment? And then finally, Title I. Um, our Title I leadership team met on September 10th to review our Title I policy. So we have a draft that I will be bringing you next month um, to update our board policy. Events, Josh and Tom shared lots of them. The only one that they did not touch on in specific to us is October 4th. We do Food for America, so our students will go to the high school. Each grade level has about an hour and a half that they go through different rotations with, with Mr. Meyer. And then finally, piggybacking off of parent-teacher conferences, you will see our communication come home in family folders this, this week, actually. And then sign-up links will be available the following week. And when does Goose start? Goose is hoping to start on the 24th, so we are, Mr. M is currently pre-teaching expectations. Our anticipated start date is hopefully next Tuesday. That's awesome, and I'll have to say, I'm just gonna, just gonna call it out. I just loved the headline in the paper, Talk to me, Goose. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> well written, well written. Agreed, thank you. <laughs> For all you Top Gun fans. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Top Gun fans, talk to me. I got it right away, and my husband's like, I don't get it. Like, the, does, the, does the dog talk? I'm like, never mind. <laughs> Just forget it. It's not a, not a real pop culture guy. <laughs> oh, thank you. Good evening. So at the beginning of our um, in-service time, we start out with 4K parent-teacher conferences. So that's done both in our Children's House Montessori and our traditional 4K. And that is always just a wonderful way for them to start introducing themselves and their parents and students to their classroom and the school. So those were very well received and, and they enjoy doing that each year. Unfortunately, we were unable to have our open house at the beginning of the school year due to construction constraints, but our teachers and all of the staff members, including some guests in our building, helped put our building back together and just really, we had a great start to our first day. It was just a delightful day to have everybody in the building and it just, it was, it was really great to see the students back and the parents were excited to be there and, and see the school in a finished, in a finished way. So it was a great, great way to start our year. Um, our 4K students um, joined our lean family on September 6th, so they start school a few days later. So they all are in and we're now all together, so that is great to have everybody in the building. Our LPO had an ice cream social last week, inviting new families into our group over, over at the lean, lean Parent Organization. So that is always a place where they're looking for more people to join their group. So 
Um, new teacher mentor mentee program, as Jeff said, is in full swing. We have um, a lot of great things connected to that to be able to bring people closer to district information and to work with their mentors. So that is a great program that we offer. Um, our staff has been meeting during in-service and then catching up because we did an abbreviated in-service during our in-service time, but they've been meeting in their groups and their committees to join together to develop goals and objectives so that we are all working towards the same thing during the school year. Our referendum work is still continuing as they're finishing up punch lists, so forth. A lot of finishing work. It's nice to see all of the things starting to come into place. Um, yeah, they're just wonderful and, and new and improved areas in our building, and it's just being enjoyed by all our families and our staff. So it's exciting to have that happening in our building. And a huge thank you to all of the staff and the extra helpers for making all the pieces come together. I just can't you know thank everybody enough we just have a great community here that works amongst each other and helps each other out so that's a great big thank you thank you there um, our upcoming events we've gotten lots of busy things going on in our building our fast bridge bent park assessments is also happening this week we have our in service our family math night is going to be september 26 so we're getting that off going really quickly getting families and kids in for our math night. Cherrydale fundraiser starts up on October 1st. Our kindergarten field trip to the fire hall happens on the 7th. Um, our scholastic book fair happens during our first parent teacher conferences here at, uh, at Lean Elementary. Um, and then we have child development days that also happen during those parent teacher conferences, which is students that are typically younger than school age that come in and, and can meet with staff and talk about where their student is on the developmental plane. Um, LPO meeting is October 14th. Our Cherrydale fundraiser will end on the 15th. Um, our kindergarten always has their yearly ABC fashion show, something to work forward to. Um, we also are putting on, um, with the great work of our school counselors, Lisa Benson and Josh Grams are working with the county to do a parent workshop on technology and students. So that's gonna be happening on October 17th. So you'll see that information coming home soon. And it will also be shared out on our social media as well. The sign up is right through a QR code. So we're hoping to get a big crowd there. And then the Lean Fall Fun Day is listed on here on the 18th. Since then, we've been talking with our wonderful FFA group and trying to get those educational pieces in like we did with the corn maze, only this year it's a soybean maze. Um, but the 18th didn't quite work to do that, so we're adjusting that probably more towards October 9th. But they're gonna be the specialists, um, Annie Brayton, Shannon Hengsgaard, and um, Renee Anderson and Danielle Peterson are going to pull off another nice, fun fall festivity day. So I'm excited to see that happen for our students. Paula, is there, a, is there an age group that you're trying to hit with the parent workshop? Is it, is it a certain age group of... of yep, of yep, we're kids? sending it all home to our elementary age students. Just so the elementary yep, age yep. kids? Yeah. Okay. But open to all, correct? Correct. Yes. Okay. Well, correct. well, that was my, that was, yes. I guess that was my question. Anybody can come. Is, is the yes. program geared to just parents, or is it geared to parents of a certain age? Um, it's it, we are looking for it to be towards our school age kids in our building, but yes, it's done through the county, so they will have a lot of information that could be you know relevant. Yes, okay. absolutely. All right, um, a good start to the year um, on behalf of our student services team. Thank you to our case managers. Uh, thank you for parents sending those kids every day and the conversations that are happening to make a positive start uh, for kids in the school district of Avery. So that, that's great. So I just wanna give a shout out to community members, parents, uh, staff. Um, and then we'll move into indicator 14. Um, for those that don't yet have the special education uh, cyclical indicators memorized, remember that indicator 14 is post-secondary outcomes of students with disabilities. So that's graduates um, a couple years ago um, we had 19 of those and then it's a phone survey to those um, students and their families to find out you know what are they doing are they competitively employed are they pursuing on-the-job training are they at a higher um, entered higher education or, or maybe they're just on the job working 
or at a technical school. So um, we get this information to inform our practices, hopefully to improve. Um, and you know, we're one of the, one of the highest in terms of our relationships with the tech colleges and transcript and courses. So that's great. So improve, but also just keep doing what we're doing um, to uh, give access to students to make sure that they're competitively employed or engaged in um, higher learning after they um, would graduate from the school district of Amory. Um, so based on responses, we, we do receive a, an incentive, financial incentive from the state. That usually comes out around March or April, and typically we'll report that at that time. Um, a sensory room at the elementary school, this is just one of a long list of positives from the referendum and the work done at Lean Elementary. We now have a dedicated space for occupational therapy, um, for our occupational therapy assistant to do some work. Um, they're really you know excited to have this space to not have to battle and kind of jockey for um, meeting space and, and have a dedicated space to meet with kids that they can be comfortable in and have those sensory items that um, are so useful in delivering those therapies. Um, space is also shared with physical therapists who might um, provide services to just a limited number of kids as well so it's a bonus to that group as well. Um, finally, we've got a training coming up, a Behavior Solutions. This is a three-part training through CESA. Um, it's um, with uh, an author and uh, an individual who's worked in schools for well over a decade on positive behavioral interventions and supports, and now what's called equitable multi-level systems of support. Um, and, and just by, by side road of a, a, a previous experience, I, I worked at a, another district and had an opportunity to meet John Hannigan and have lunch with him after a session that he did in a former district. And I can tell you that he's an engaging, bright individual who's been doing this work a long time. So I'm excited for this opportunity for um, our administrative team and, uh, um, and, a, and a few counseling um, staff to attend and, and hopefully put in place some of these tools and practices throughout the year. Concludes the report for tonight. Thanks, Brad. <coughs> Matt, do you have anything to add? I do not. All right. We'll move along to our informational <laughs> items and start with the referendum and building your grounds update. And that is Joe and Steve. How is it going? Uh, things are so different. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, I so I walked through the school um, the Friday before Labor Day weekend. And I was like, there's just no way. And there's no way, especially the elementary school, no way. Mm -hmm. And uh, you pulled it off, the whole crew pulled it off. Um, Amazing people. Yeah, a lot of people came in, so it was great. Um, high school, we walked through the, uh, the science departments last time and vastly different and quite an amazing space. Um, it's exciting to see all those changes. And again, for the public, there is so much that happened in this referendum that's just out of sight, you know, behind walls and up in ceilings. And um, but it's it's long term fixes and in some in some cases things that were well overdue. So uh, then we toured the uh, the baseball field and the football field. Um, crazy cool stuff going on in both locations, and I'm excited to see what's gonna come next with the softball fields as that, that continues to be worked on. So still more work to do, but things are looking really great. Uh, I am curious how, I, I couldn't make it to the, the game on Friday, how were traffic flows and how have traffic flows been for the schools? Tom was doing traffic <laughs> crowd control. Tom, how'd it go? <laughs> <laughs> it went great. It, it went really, really well. There was one gentleman one guy got that wasn't, he was from out of town. He wasn't very happy. Because he had to, he was there, at, you know, right after the game had already started and had to park out in ways. But yeah, yeah. Well, could we just hear that from a principal that knows what's going on? Yeah, he, he said. I, he said, "Well, I told him he couldn't park on the grass because the grass is trying to grow." And he said, I, can, "Is there a principal that knows what's going on?" And I said, "Well, I am one of them." He goes, "I know. I want one of the principals that knows what's going on." <laughs> <laughs> and I said, "Okay, keep on moving." So, yeah. That was That's a good line. Funny. You got to admit that was. Yeah, a good it was pretty line. good. I set myself up. Coming. <laughs> Yeah, but I, I, you know, I, I was at the game, and I, um, 
I was I thought it was just amazing. You know, people were so excited, mm -hmm. and the traffic was difficult a little bit. But you know, you have to understand too that a lot large part of that high school parking lot is still taken up with equipment and stuff. And when that's when that's clear, it's going to be a lot easier. And um, we didn't have the visiting side open yeah. in a visiting team bleacher, which really alleviates it because then you got a bunch of people parking in the middle of the no lot. That's where I parked. <coughs> and if I could have come in that door, I would have been in my seat in two minutes. I had to walk yeah. around; it's no big deal. But the visiting team, they'll be in in, in seconds yeah. when that's open. And that those bleachers are set to arrive at the very end of the month. And I'm hoping that we can mark some more handicapped spaces out there for... Yep. The well, we had a conversation today about that. Yep. So more growth and more, more additions happening with... Yes. It's not done. Know, as we learn. It's as not we done. Learn. So anyway, it was exciting stuff and looking great. Very exciting. Joe, anything to add there? No, I I don't. I must have missed the meeting. You did. Uh, oh, okay, I don't think sorry. I, I don't think I got a text or anything. But no, nope, there the, wasn't a text. That but morning. the truth is, yeah. is I've been working two jobs, so I was going to apologize. Uh, mm -hmm. I haven't had a day off. Okay. So. Sorry, I didn't. I didn't realize that you weren't at the meeting. So, um, Sean, anything to add to that? Otherwise, no. Well, please know we're not done. And to reiterate Steve's remarks, we are uh, much of what you cannot see is where much of the work was done up in the ceilings and behind the walls. But you will be able to see that which is visible. We're working on the plans for grand opening of athletics on homecoming Friday, which is the 27th. And we're also looking at uh, potentially an open house uh, immediately after, in a, a couple of weeks after that. Uh, but we don't want to put a date on the calendar until we're totally done so everyone can see its finished product. But we absolutely want to show off what's there. Uh, I know the kids are excited about it. The parents in the community are probably equally excited. It's pretty spectacular. Uh, I was at the meeting, or I was at the game on Friday night. Uh, just uh, wanted to see, you know, the coaches, both teams, the kids. Uh, wanted to see the community there, and just to just to get the feedback and the vibe and the feel of uh, to know that this board, you know, made right decisions there and and be available and. Um, I will say I, I didn't hear anything negative. There, it was a packed house. I, there was no room for me to sit down in a bleacher. Um, the, it was, uh, the atmosphere was much different than many of the games that I've attended over, over the years and years I've here. Uh, Dale, you were there? Yes, very nice. Um, the field's awesome. Uh, the sound system worked great. Um, just, Maybe too good. Yeah, it's loud. <laughs> it's loud. It's uh, loud. <laughs> And people downtown have told me that it's loud, so it works. That's, yes. It works yes. very well downtown as well. Yes, so yes. Um, I, I had but, a family member actually texting me during the game and said, I heard a touchdown, and I'm like, are you yeah. listening on, are you watching? And he's like, I, nope, I can hear it on the PA. I'm like, oh, that's interesting, <laughs> cool. And we were only about 50%, I think, that night, Yeah, right? but it was, it was, it's, it's very fun. exciting. It's a beautiful facility that the community should be very proud of. So. Yeah, uh, and, you know, obviously with their their money and their support of making that happen. It's the only way that it happened for the kids in this community. It's, it's really something to build off of. Gwen, you were there as well, right? I second everything you said. It was amazing. <laughs> and and shout out to the little second graders. Yeah. 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 Because yes. frankly, they did amazing. They I was like good. impressed. <laughs> Some of them really have rhythm. Yes. And, <laughs> and what, what were our second boat? graders? Who, what oh, they were they were like they did a cheer camp and then they led the cheers and along with the some high school seniors. It was whiteout night. And so I was just so impressed. And I agree with you, the the atmosphere was wonderful and the excitement um, that everybody showed was pretty amazing. Did. Those little was, kids were pumped. They, they were, were they, they, they were, were Pretty, and we pretty also did yeah. soccer on Thursday, and soccer went off as well. I know that Josh was there. I was there. It was fantastic. Uh, I, Lynette Wentz and I actually granted special permission for Luciana to go onto the track. She wanted to touch it and jump on it, and we allowed her to do that. She said, this is going to work. And I was like, well, that's good, because it's that's cost way too much for it not to work. <laughs> so she's eager to try it out. Good. Uh, well, we should say thank you to the, the four, uh, I believe, all seniors that did the Star Spangled Banner. Yes. Because oh, they are amazing. Yes. And yes. my house guest listened to the football game from our house, too. So yeah. ah. it, the PA system does work well. <laughs> yes. Wow. Yes. And, and the little, the second graders in the cheer camp, that was cheer camp that was uh, put on through summer school. So um, that was really cool to see an integration of a summer school program 
that came to life out on the football field with all the big kids. Jean Edwards deserves yes, the credit Jean for Edwards that. Yes, Jean Edwards led that credit. I think she's still exhausted today from <laughs> what she said. So. I was impressed they remembered all the cheers. Yeah. I think they learned something like 110 cheers or something like that, right? That, that was crazy. I'm like, I couldn't even think of 110 cheers, and I'm never at a loss for words. So that was... You that were cheering. We were near enough to hear you, Sean. Yeah. You were cheering. Well, those, those, those cheers probably were for the second graders to hear, so <laughs> <laughs> I won't be teaching that class anytime soon. And John, did you want to go over the budget piece of this? Absolutely. Yeah. There, there's been some question um, about this budget, so... Um, Sean, myself, and uh, George had a good budget meeting with Krauss Anderson and the LHB uh, just last week. We are still on D indeed on budget. Um, I finally was able to get them to correct their error, um, thanks to Mick, Miss Becky, um, for grammatically checking it. Um, so the bottom right corner shows a surplus of two thousand or two million ninety nine thousand four hundred and five dollars if you go to the second page that is the owner contingency or not the order and contingency the owner provided if you scroll to the bottom Becky that number on the left that is the number if we were to do everything that is on that list that is how much it would cost and so if you were to take the two numbers and minus them from each other you will see that if we did everything as stated on there, which we won't be, we would be over by about $33,000. So this is also, some of these are hypothetical. So Kraus Anderson is going through the exercise. I provided them with our distributions of those funds through since the beginning of the project. So between George and Kraus Anderson, they're currently on working on their final with total numbers. You can see some round numbers in there. Round numbers almost inherently never mean actual. Um, the ones that aren't, those are actually actual. And a lot of them have been shockingly coming in under budget um, or have been included in other things. So I do want to remind the board and the public that both the athletic work and the construction of the referendum is all covered under GMP. So if we were $2 million over budget, that's shame on Kraus Anderson, and guess who's eating it? It's them, because mm -hmm. we do have a guaranteed maximum price. Yeah. So we, I definitely understand the confusion with that one, um, and I appreciate everyone's patience. But yes, we are not $2 million over budget. We are right where we should be. Does that make sense? Yes, that makes sense to me. Anybody else have any questions about that? All right. That wraps up the building and grounds. So strategic plan 2025 to 2030 update. Mr. Right. Garfler. You see the great all portions of things we've already done. The first strategic plan committee meeting is Wednesday of next week, September 25th. Uh, the folks in this room are a part of that strategic plan. We have a couple of community members that have already expressed interest. They're on the list. And uh, building principals and I meet tomorrow, and we're going to identify a couple of parents to be on that list as well. So we'll have somewhere between 15 and 20 people at that meeting on September 25th. That's at 6 p.m. and that's on the other side of this wall in the media center. So that's the next step in the process. Question, that was the only time I was wondering what the time was, so. 6 p.m. In the media center. Yes. Okay. All right, any discussion on the strategic plan? Any questions? All right, moving along. Right down to the policy 163, board okay. member development opportunities. And the reason these are on here is these are all 100s, simply going a series at a time. There are nine series, you go all the way through the 900s, I believe it is. And uh, simply taking all the 100s that are out of date or have language that's just obscure. Uh, again, this is a first reading, so whatever you want this to be, it could be, be what it is right now before any changes if you want it to be, just trying to clean it up. So this first one is board member development opportunities. And that paragraph in the middle, I don't think, it hasn't happened in my time, and I don't know that it happened in times prior <coughs> to me either. It simply states that when there's <coughs> upcoming in-service opportunities for board members, I'll make you aware of those. You'll go ahead and take care of those things and come back and share the information with us. Again, if that's what you want us to do, then we can <coughs> do that. But that hasn't been done, so that's why I've struck it out, if you will. The other change 
in my time, and I've been here 19 years, I don't know that any board members ever go into the national convention. There is a national convention, uh, but it says that you're going to determine who goes and the number of delegates and so forth and so on. If we're not sending anyone, then that's probably obsolete as well. But again, it can remain the same if you wanted to. Those are recommended changes. Any discussion on policy 163? No, it seemed pretty straightforward to me. Yeah, I, I would have no, nothing to add on that. Okay, move along to policy 171.1, public notification of board meetings. Well, I, I, it, there's only oh. one thing. If you're gonna do it officially, if we're getting rid of this national board sentence, we need to strike out the heading too. Yep. yep. So. Uh, this policy, uh, the middle sentence, simply states meeting uh, announcements will be given to radio and television media outlets located in the district. We really don't, we don't have that. We have radio, uh, we don't have television. We've never given the postings to the radio. We've just posted them in the same way we've posted them for 20 plus years and we have been in compliance with state statute all along. Again, if you want to leave it as radio and television, you can. It's just a language change. In this pol these last two policies haven't been visited in forever. This one was 1992, was first approved, so that was a while ago. Revised in 95, yeah. I, yeah, if we don't have any of those, it seems like it's been okay. It's been a while. I'm not sure that we need to really add social media to that as long as it's posted in two places and we do post that we publicly. We post it by state statute every single time in the right way. Any conversation regarding the uh, public notification of board meetings? Does it have to be posted with the paper? I don't know the statute, I guess, I'm sorry. I believe it's... Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't have to be the paper, but it has to be X places that are of public consumption, and the free press is as good a place as any I think it actually does have to be in the oh, paper, okay. if we have a paper in our district. If you have oh. a local... Yes, I believe that is there right. And then it has to be in at least one other place. I think it has to be posted in a minimum of two places, so that fits and the... The statute isn't really updated for websites and things like that should we obviously right. have it on the website as well okay we'll continue riding with the free press <laughs> <laughs> all right um any other discussion about that all right moving along to policy 173 special board meetings uh this is again as a 100s uh the word written request uh we have at, we've had folks ask for special meetings we haven't done it by written request it's in essence just been done by request and that request certainly could be the board clerk what i think has happened is the president is why i put president there and then the, the rest of it shall notify each board member in writing at his or her home and personally in accordance with state law i think in accordance with state law was sufficient i don't know that anyone's ever been notified in writing at his or her home um it's it's typically been we're having a special meeting on this date and this time and here's the agenda so to speak and then the next portion says special board meetings shall be open to the public unless the board determines that a closed session of the board is necessary but you also have to make sure you're following state law and board policy in that process and again this one hasn't been touched i don't know the year but it's been a while 95. so that's again merely recommended language you can take it as is or change it or however you see fit any discussion sure is this is this different from a special board meeting to asking something to be placed on the agenda i guess that's what i was talking about earlier. no two different uh two different things Okay. So usually a special board meeting would be something like um, we'd have a personnel issue that would arise and the board would need to meet, which we've done several times. Um, and those would be closed session meetings, but they still have to be posted, even though they're closed session. So that would fall under this category. If there's something just on the meeting agenda, that would be under our other policy of how something gets put on the agenda. And I think we revisited that policy a year ago. So two different policies. Yeah, that's what I was talking about earlier with you, though. That's, yeah. I was mistaken. Yeah, two this. different policies. Okay. This okay. This that made sense then. <laughs> Sorry. The strategic plan next Wednesday is, in essence, a special meeting. Yes. Yes. If we're going to, yeah, there's going to be more than two board members there, then, yep. Okay. Are we obligated to wait? I have a 
because of it being a first reading, are we obligated to wait till next month to make decisions out of that? Yes. Well, we do we two, readings. <coughs> two readings. Two readings. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So yeah, just discussion right now for anything that needs to be changed for the next reading for next month. So. Okay. Anything else on those? I don't. Okay. Then we'll see those again next month. Um, hopefully to be approved, probably as written, if nobody has anything. If you mull it over, obviously within the next month and you think that something isn't working, then we can bring that up next month. We can make those changes. It's the second reading and then we can also approve at the same time. Okay. okay? All right. Um, the short-term borrowing approval that was scheduled on the uh, meeting agenda tonight was is not going to happen just due to some paperwork, some back and forth, some numbers that are still being negotiated and gone through. Can I have a, I would entertain a motion to table the short-term borrowing approval until next month. I would make a motion we table short-term borrowing for a month. Steve, is there a second? Second. Dale? It's been moved and seconded into to table short-term borrowing approval until next month. Although, is there any discussion on tabling this? Hearing none, we'll proceed to vote. All those in favor of tabling this action item until next month, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, please signify by saying no. Okay, tabled, uh, the short-term borrowing is tabled until next month. And so then we'll move along to the donations of the district. A few donations, you see up on the screen. Uh, thank you to the Eddie H. and Donald L. Olson Fund of the Amory Area Community Foundation for awarding the FFA a program with a grant of $6,669. Many thanks to the Amory Lions Club for their angel fund donation of $3,328 from the funds of their annual, be the 13th annual golf tournament. Thank you to Wisconsin Credit Union and their customers for the donation of hygiene products and money for the, for the angel fund from the Scrub-A-Dub Drive. Mm -hmm. Many thanks to Process Technology for their, don sorry, their donation of school supplies and $250 for student lunches. Thank you to Crystal Orthodontics St. Croix Valley for their first week of school cookie trays for the staff in each building. Thank you to John, Don Johnson's Cumberland Motors Ford Chrysler Dodge, Fiat, Jeep, and Ram, that's a heck of a long title, for the complimentary <laughs> replacement of wiper blades for school staff. And many thanks for your generosity and support, and you need a motion if you want to accept those. Do I have a motion to right. accept the donations? I will make the motions we, that we, motions, the motion that we accept the donations, and thank you. Is there a second? second. It's been moved and seconded to accept the donations for the district. Is there any discussion? I only have a question, but that can happen after the motion's done. Okay. Uh, the only discussion that I have is I just, it just honestly, I, and I've said it, I think every month, and you're probably tired of hearing it, but month in and month out, it just blows me away to see the donations come into this district. And I mean, you're talking a <coughs> sum total of, I don't know, $10,000 just in dollars. And then not only, I mean, wiper blades like what like really cool like who would have thought that and if you didn't participate and you have bugs all over your windshield now you're probably wishing you had <laughs> so uh really cool things that are going on in this community and it just always um speaks to the community in which we live and um it it never ceases to amaze me the the generosity from others which is why i stayed in this community so um does anybody else have anything anything to add to that any other comments Hearing none, we'll proceed to vote. All those in favor of accepting donations of the district with many, many heartfelt thanks, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those in favor, or all those opposed, please signify by saying no. Motion passed. Uh, donations and grants accepted <coughs> by the district. Thank you very much, and a round of applause. Yes, thank you. <laughs> My question is, can you explain to me the vastness of the Angel Fund and the, the stuff that it does? The Angel Fund is for kids that are demonstrate a need and they articulate that need merely by appearance. They say something to the teacher, guidance, administration, uh, school nutrition, anybody. Uh, any donation that comes in, unless it's earmarked for a certain uh, building by, their, by the donor's request, is split up evenly between the four buildings and it's used for a variety of things, and it depends developmentally what those needs are. Elementary and intermediate, and I don't want to steal your thunder, but you're talking 
hats, gloves, no pants, jackets, shoes, etc. When you're talking about middle school and high school, you're talking about, it, it, this could be true of elementary and intermediate as well, field trips, we've had folks have uh, uh, a applications that they need to fill out for certain things at the high school, uh, athletic fees, um, any yeah, others? Calculators mm -hmm. the kids can need. Uh, some kids can't afford some shoes that they need for a, a certain sporting event, and we will help fund them with the, with the funds that come in from the Angel Fund. So it's helping out the kids that maybe don't have the needs to participate with everyone else. Tech and projects, yep. art supplies. Yep, backpacks. It is in the tune, in the somewhere of 40000 a year that is donated and expended through the Angel Fund. And it's directly the building principals and Sean who are the ones who administer that. And lunch, so lunch accounts. We've lunch actually accounts. on three occasions, two occasions, had the lunch accounts zeroed out, as in by a donor. Don't know who it is still to this day. And on the third occasion, they donated a sum of money and we put a, uh, an opportunity out there for folks to apply for it. And uh, they would apply for that money and it would be theirs to pay off lunch accounts. We've had three in essence times where we've zeroed out lunch accounts. There are folks that cannot pay for lunch, even with free and reduced. If you take extras, you gotta pay for that. And some kids, these are the only meals they're getting. So there's an obstacle there in finance that our community is addressing in a big way. Thank you. You're welcome. I guess it's, it's never lost to hear the amount of money that comes in, but also to know that <coughs> It's a need that's in this district um, that we all need to be very mindful of and um, the community really answering the call for those kids to um, be able to be taken care of in that way and to be um, on, a, on a level playing field with their, with their peers. So thanks for that. And then we'll move along to personnel action. Okay, personnel items for the month. We have Tiana Anderson at Clubhouse Assist. These are new employment and extracurricular contracts. Tiana Anderson in Clubhouse as an assistant teacher. Donna Felstead, custodian. Matthew Hilborn, custodian. Douglas White and William Miller as bus dri buy and drivers. Sorry. Uh, Brenda Pentelis, school nutrition. Nicole Vesper, new school nutrition. A reassignment of Clubhouse assistant teacher to clubhouse teacher in all three cases for Destiny DeCosimo, Erica Johnson, and Heidi Pearson. Uh, resignations, uh, Bradley Baumgartner in the area of Director of Pupil Services, Brittany Dusick in School Nutrition, and Brianna Iverson as a para-educator. Those are your personnel items, and you would need to make a motion to approve those, if you see fit. I make a motion to approve it, and since there's only one in the room, Brad, thanks for your work for the district. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Um, as I said to staff on parting, um, you have a skilled, dedicated, and student-centered group of professionals that, that I work with every day in a great community, so it's been an honor. Are, are you just you. a little bit sad that this was your last report that you'll have to give? <laughs> just a little bit, yeah. <laughs> you shouldn't be that sad. <laughs> <laughs> well, we wish you well in your next endeavor, and, and you know, we're sad that, you, that you're leaving us, but we know that it's what's best for your family and you, and um, the people down where you're going will benefit greatly from your expertise and your knowledge. So, Thank you so much. You're welcome, Brad. Is there a second to the approving the board personnel meeting? Second. Uh, Gwen? Mm -hmm. Is there any discussion on personnel action? Hearing none, we'll proceed to vote. All of those in favor of uh, passing personnel action and approving is presented. Please signify by saying aye. 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 All of those opposed, please signify by saying no. Motion passed. Personnel action is granted. There is no community comments, I'm assuming. Aaron, you didn't have anything to say? Nothing? All right. Thanks for just coming and showing up, though, I guess. Um, and we have no reason, I believe, to go back into closed session tonight. All right, with that, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Make that. To adjourn. Okay. Second. Gwen and Steve, all those in favor of adjourning, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, please signify by saying no. Motion passed. Meeting adjourned.